Good morning uh, or afternoon, wherever you're catching us here at uh, Journey of Faith Online. We are so glad you are with us today. Let us pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord God, thank you for your mercies that are new every day. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Thank you for your kindness that leads us to repentance. Lord, we give you this service and we pray that as we worship you and as we lift up your word and listen to your word, that you would draw us closer to yourself, Lord, as we need you. And that never changes. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry, drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, Come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son save us whoever believes in him will live forever we're gonna sing that again for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever So bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son save us whoever believes in him will live forever and the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so loved god so loved the world Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever and the power of hell forever defeated now it is well I'm living in freedom for God so Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. And there
there is a truth older than the ages there is a promise things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light that overwhelms the darkness there is a kingdom that forever reigns there is a freedom from the chains that bind us Jesus Jesus who walks on the waters who speaks to the sea who stands in the fire beside me he roars like a lion he bled as a lamb He carries my healing in his hands Jesus There is a name I call in times of trouble There is a song that comforts in the night there is a voice that calms the storm that rages. It is Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the water, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me. understand this this name that you've given us Lord Lord it's the name that we that 
we walk under, that we submit ourselves to, that we that we recognize as Lord. Lord, there is power in that name, Lord, because of who you are and what you've done. And so, Lord, we I pray that we'd never be ashamed We'd never shrink back from that name. We'd never hesitate to call on that name, Lord. That we'd understand how how completely you've adopted us, adopted us into your family, made us sons and daughters. this name of Jesus. So I pray, Lord, for this church, for all that are listening, that for an infusion of faith, an infusion of boldness, an infusion of love. There's so much that goes on, Lord, with that name. So much behind it. It means so much, Lord. Yes, we take it for granted. We we forget. But we do trust you, Lord, and we we pray for more of you in our lives, Lord. Messiah, my Savior. There is power in your name, Lord. You are my rock. You're my redeemer. There is power in your name, in your name. And in the name of Jesus, Amen. You know, and, and Scott, you remind me, and you know, church, so often we use the Lord's name in vain and we take it for granted. But as Scott just saying today, let us never forget that there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And in fact, the Bible even tells us that demons flee at the name of Jesus Christ. So it is my hope and my prayer for each and every one of you that you would stop using the Lord's name in vain and begin to use it the way he intended it to, for power, for whatever power you need in your life, for whatever encouragement, whatever strength you need, whatever protection, that you would always cry out, Jesus, 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 and know that when we use his name as he intended, that he will bring and send us the power that only he can give us. So Lord, we thank you for your name. We thank you for your power. In Jesus' glorious and awesome and mighty name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, church, and I'm so glad that you are here with us to worship today, and, and it is my hope and my prayer that you will, you will use this service as an opportunity to reach out and evangelize to other people. You know, we, we're reading about Paul right now in Acts, where he was in prison, but yet even stuck in prison, he still used this as an opportunity to evangelize to others. So, I, pro- I encourage you that if you're on Facebook, you would set up a watch party with your family and friends, perhaps people that don't know Jesus but need to know Jesus. If you're on our website, I encourage you to click that invite button and ask people to join you in your service today, no matter where they meet, be, no matter around the world, church. Now is not the time for us just to stay hidden in our houses, but even in our houses, just as Paul was in prison, now is the time to reach out and evangelize and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, as he told us, to all ends of the earth. And who would have ever thought that they would have the technology that could allow us to reach all ends of the earth, even in our, in our living room. So I encourage you where you are to be an evangelist this morning, 
not a visitor, not a spectator, but be an evangelist. Reach out right now to your family and friends and encourage them to join us today as we study God's Word. Just a couple quick announcements. Don't forget we have our online studies throughout the week. Tuesday night, I do an online Bible study on the book of John, the Gospel of John. We have our Wednesday night Zoom with Dave Deloach as he continues an amazing Bible study. And then we have our Thursday night prayer this week with Randy on our um, on Zoom as well at 7 o'clock. All those events are at 7 o'clock. If you do not receive the link that I send out the morning of those events, please email me at pastorkevin at jlfaith.com. That's pastorkevin at jlfaith.com. And I will make sure you start getting those links. And then just to put a bug in your ear, ladies, I want to let you know right now, December 12th, we are going to be having a very special Woman's Christmas Luncheon. It's going to be different than what we've done in the past. Number one, it's going to be outside and it's going to be in the middle of the day. Uh, but, but I want to let you know about it now so you can put it on your calendars. And there will be more information following about that event. And there will also be information posted on Facebook, Instagram, and our Twitter account as well. So, so I encourage you to get connected to our, in our social media, social media, Instagram, Twitter, because that's where you're going to find out all the things that are going on in our church and church. You might not realize it, even though technically the church is still shut down. We are doing more now than we were doing when the doors were open. So I encourage you to go to our sites often and see what's happening at Journey of Faith this week. And if you have your Bibles, if you want to open up to Acts chapter 24, I almost said John because I'm also teaching a John Bible study, but Acts chapter 24, we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 27. And the title of today's message is Don't Wait. Now, let me ask you guys a quick question here. How many of you right now, and let's be honest, you're, you're in your living room, so nobody's going to see you raise your hands, but, but let's be honest. How many of you right now have an important decision that you have to make or, or some important action that you have to take, but you've been delaying that action or that decision? You know, maybe it's that you don't think you have enough information and you want to you wanna find out more. You know, I remember when I was young, my dad would, would go to car dealerships to, to, to negotiate and try to buy a car. And it seemed like it went on for months to the point where when my dad walked onto the dealership lot, the, the, the salespeople wouldn't even come to meet him anymore because they just knew he was just coming to ask questions, but, but he never took action on it. So, so maybe you don't feel like you have enough information and you keep trying to get more information, hoping that... Whatever information you find will be the deciding factor that will help you take that action or make that decision. Or maybe you do know the decision that you have to make or the action you have to take, but you're worried about the outcome and how it may affect people around you or how it actually may impact you. And maybe because you know how it might impact someone else. You, you choose not to take that action or you choose not to make that decision because you don't want to upset someone around you. You know, I love the quote that Mark Twain, and I love Mark Twain, I used to love reading his books, but Mark Twain had a saying and it said, never put off till tomorrow what may be done the day after tomorrow as well. He was the ultimate, uh, uh, that's the ultimate idea of procrastinating. Why procrastinate for tomorrow when you can wait two days and put it off just as well? In fact, my dad used to have a saying, manana never comes. But sometimes our problems, when, or sometimes when we delay, it's not really a big problem. In other words, it's not really a big deal if we decide not to eat dinner at 5 o'clock, but yet we delay it till five, 6 or 7 o'clock. But sometimes those actions we fail to take and those decisions we fail to make could actually turn out to be deadly. Now, there's a physical death where if we notice there's something wrong with our health and, and we choose to ignore the signs and symptoms, if we delay too long, it could be too late when we finally go to the doctor and they won't be able to do anything for us. But there's also a spiritual death that if we don't make the right decisions and we don't take the right actions, that we could also experience a physical death if we don't do what we know what is right. 
See, it's very important that we learn that we cannot and we should not delay and procrastinate. In other words, as the title says today, that we need to learn that we shouldn't delay or don't wait. Too many people have this idea that they can delay their decision about Christ. You know, they think, well, Jesus has been here since the beginning. He'll be around tomorrow and the next week and the next year. So, so what's the big rush? In other words, it's kind of like what we read in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus Christ will be here today and forever. But we must understand that even though Jesus will be here forever, maybe we won't. In fact, sometimes we spend so much time delaying that decision about Jesus Christ that we eventually run out of time to make that decision. Benjamin Franklin said, you may delay, but time will not. And actually, I would actually change that saying, so this would be PK saying, I would say that you may delay, but God will not. So whether or not we choose to make decisions or take actions when it comes to our spiritual life, we must understand and realize that just because we are delaying, it doesn't mean that God does. And as we look at this next group of scripture in Acts chapter 24, we see that Paul will be engaged in a series of private meetings with Felix the governor. I like to call him Felix the cat. Remember, a, a, a wicked, corrupt man. But no matter how many times he met with Felix, his message to Felix was always the same. And it was simply this. Don't wait. Don't wait for your decision to follow Jesus Christ. Don't wait for your decision to repent and receive his forgiveness. Don't wait to change your life today. And I believe if Paul was here right now speaking in this church, he would give us the same message today. Don't wait. Perhaps right now, even when I say those words, don't wait. Already, it's bringing decisions and actions to your mind that you know you need to take, should take, must take, but you haven't been willing to take. So, so I pray that if that's you right now, that this message today would give you the strength, the encouragement, the guidance, and the direction that you need in order to take the action or make the decision that you know you must and you know that the Lord is calling you today. So today is the day, church, to take action, to stop delaying, to begin living. And when we can do that, church, no matter what is going on around us, we can ultimately stop worrying about our future. So if you have your Bibles, excuse me for a second, we're going to open up to Acts chapter 24, and we're going to look at verses 22 through 27. And beginning in verse 22, it says, But when Felix heard these things, Having more accurate knowledge of the way, that's Jesus, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who is Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, also he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, waiting, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Now, just to give you a brief background and reminder of where we are, church, this is considered what's called the Paul Caesarean imprisonment. Now, 
You remember, and as we've said, we're going to, as we go through a little bit further in Acts, we're going to read about Rome, Paul's imprisonment in Rome as well. But, but this is his Caesarean imprison uh, time era, if you will. And, and last week, remember, the Jewish leaders came in front of Felix, and they levied, levied some pretty serious charges against Paul, but there was one catch. They were all lies. They called him names. They made fact, false accusations but none of them were real. And remember I told you that no matter the situation, the circumstances, when people begin to challenge and question our faith, they're going to do it in one of three ways. They're going to make personal attacks against us. They're going to make political attacks against us. And they're going to try to make religious attacks against us. And that's exactly what they tried to do to Paul. But they were all lies. These leaders, including Ananias, the the, the, Jew, the high priest who was in his 80s went 130 miles round trip and all they had to show for it were lies. And at the end of the passage last week, as Paul was giving his defense, Paul asked, where were all the accusers? In other words, the Jewish leaders from Ephesus that had caused this commotion. And in fact, he even took it one step further and he challenged the Jewish leaders and their high-priced attorney that were there with them to provide proof of any accusations or any wrongdoing on Paul's part. But as Paul challenged them and gave them an opportunity to provide proof, they stayed silent. Why? Because even they knew their lies and accusations were not real. And under Roman law, if you were to give false testimony during a quote-unquote trial, it could and would lead to death. But even though their statements were lies, their statements were very effective. In fact, their, their lies were so effective, it kept Paul in prison for years. In fact, in Caesarea alone for about two years even though all of them, including Felix, Felix, knew that Paul was innocent. The Jewish leaders chose to spoke, speak lies, but Paul in his defense relied on the truth. What's interesting, Paul's entire trial was only 20 verses long, and then it was over. But even though there was no guilty verdict, even though there was no evidence, Paul still could not do what he wanted to do. Paul still couldn't go where he wanted to go. And you know, it's easy to say, I feel sorry for Paul in this situation. But, but here in my heart, church, the one I really feel sorry for in this situation is Felix. Because Felix the governor knew that he was trapped in his own agenda and for his own personal benefit. He knew that Paul was innocent, but he was so caught up in the what's in it for me mindset that he was living in that he had no way to get out of it. And, and maybe right now you yourself know what's right in life, what you must do, what you should do, but you have been so caught up in the lies of the enemy, the trickery of the enemy, the temptation of the enemy, that you're so busy living that what's in it for me life that you can't make the right decision or take the action that God wants you to. In fact, in verse 26, it said, and we're talking about Felix, that he had hoped that money would be given to him by Paul that he might release him. He was looking for any way out of this so that Paul could actually be released from prison. In fact, I'm sure there wouldn't have been, even been a, 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 too much of a, a, an anger from Felix if God would have done for Paul what he did for Peter, where the prison doors just kind of fell down and Paul walked out. He was looking for any way to get Paul out of prison, just as Pilate didn't want to put Jesus in prison. He didn't want to persecute Jesus. But, but he was looking for any way, and he was probably saying, if, you know, if he would just give me a little bit of money, I could release him. Because even though the Roman government expected their citizens to live by the law, unfortunately what we see is that the Roman leaders, the politicians, were very corrupt. And even though bribery was illegal in Rome, it was very much common and very much expected. 
And see, church, here's why Felix was trapped. Because we read in verse 22 that Felix had a good understanding of Christianity. Maybe it was because he had seen so many Christians around him. Maybe it was because, and we're going to read about his wife in just a few seconds, his wife was Jewish and maybe she talked about it. But, but it says in verse 22 that Felix having a more accurate knowledge of the way. In other words, he understood who Jesus was and he understood Christianity. And maybe, just maybe, from what he had heard, there was a little gnawing at his heart because he knew what was right. Maybe it was almost like what, what happened to Paul when Paul was saw and he saw Stephen stoned. But in his heart, he knew that Paul was innocent. But he was so trapped up in his own world and his own agenda that he didn't, he wasn't interested in doing what was right. He was interested in doing what was best for him. He didn't do, want to do what was right. So he delayed hoping and perhaps even praying that maybe something else would work out. But church, when we choose to wait, this reminds us that we shouldn't wait. In other words, don't wait. Because when you wait and procrastinate, it hurts those around us. So many people in the world today don't do what, what's right. They're so caught up in doing what is best for their own interests, their own agendas, their own benefits. And the more we as society live this manner, we fail to see the damage and the destruction that we are doing to ourselves, we are doing to those around us, and we are doing to society and ultimately our country. And by Felix failing to wait, he chose to see the damage that he was doing to those around him. We read in this passage that Felix and Drusilla came to talk to Paul about Jesus. In fact, in verse 24, it said, And after some days, when Felix and Drusilla, his wife, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, a little bit of history about Drusilla. She was Jewish. She was the fourth child, the youngest child of Herod Agrippa I. And if you don't remember, we talked about him. This was a really, I mean, Felix was a bad guy. Herod Agrippa I was even worse. He wanted to kill Peter. He actually ended up killing James. And remember, he walked into town one day and he had a robe on and with the light hitting it, people actually thought he was a god and they began to call him a god and, and worship him as a god. But, but church, we should never tempt God. We should never anger God. We should never try to play God because what we read earlier in Acts is that God was so angered by Agrippa the first's actions and his actual beliefs that he thought he was God that it said that he was eaten by worms. But Dr Drusilla was a very pretty woman. In fact, at the age of 15, she was sent to marry the crown prince of Asia Minor. But when she got there, uh, her dad, Agrippa I, had one condition, that, that it must be a Jewish wedding. And so the, the king of Asia Minor would have to be circumcised, and he didn't want to do that. So the wedding was called off, and he sent her back to the family. Well, about a year later, then she shipped off to marry her an inferior prince of Syria, and she was with him for a while. In fact, she would be married to him for about three years. But earlier, she had met Felix, and from the moment that she had met Felix, Felix began to work and scheme his way into trying to get Drusilla to leave her husband in order to marry him. In fact, Felix actually sent one of his friends, and, and he posed as a magician, and the magician told her to leave her husband, who she'd been married to for about three years, and, and to become Felix's wife instead. So at the age of 22, she divorced her husband and married Felix. Church, by the time she was 22, she had already been married three times. And what we understand about Felix is that this would be Felix's second marriage. Now, what's interesting is that the, the, Felix's ver first wife, whom he divorced, was actually made and married Drusilla. I guess that makes it easy, so you never forget her name, right? And, and that's one thing where if you're going to get a tattoo, you could get Drusilla 
tattooed on your body somewhere, and you don't have to worry about upsetting your wife, because if you're always going to marry Drusilla, I guess you're in good shape. But, but here is a broken couple, a desperate couple, a couple that didn't know right from wrong. And for Paul, this is exactly what he lived for. In fact, this would be an evangelist dream when a broken couple continue to call you to their, to their presence, to their audience, so you could talk to them about Jesus Christ. So here's Paul in front of Felix and Drusilla II, I guess. And it says in verse 25, Now as he reasoned with them about righteousness, so in other words, the stuff that God would approve, in other words, God's standards, he reasoned with them about righteousness, he reasoned with them about self-control, in other words, the control that we must have over fleshly desires. And then it says, And he also talked to them about the judgment to come. Church, right now, there are so many Christians living that don't believe that judgment is going to come. I'm a good person. I do good things. God is a God of grace. And yes, God is a God of grace. But as I explained to someone this week, God's grace has its limits. And if we choose to live a life, a life not of righteousness or self-control, as Paul warned Felix and Drusilla, God's judgment will come. If we choose not to meet God's standards, if we choose not to repent within our heart and ask for forgiveness, church, Paul warned them and Paul warns us that forgiveness, or excuse me, God's, God's judgment will come. Church, this wasn't a great audience. It's a wicked couple. They've been married five times between the two of them. They're probably in their maybe mid-20s at this point. But yet Paul finds himself before a young Jewish girl and a perverted, wicked Roman man. Paul pointed them both to the need for Jesus. But Luke tells us that as Felix learned more about Jesus, Felix was afraid and he wouldn't listen. In his failure to listen, and in his failure to address his own actions and his own needs, and his procrastination to delay to make that decision would not only hurt himself, but it would hurt his family. In fact, we read by one of the historians that in 79 AD, Drusilla, his wife, and I believe at least one of his children, would be killed when Mount Vesuvius erupted, Felix's resistance and procrastination towards Jesus not only hurt him, but it hurt his family. Because we have no recollection that Drusilla or her family ever accepted Jesus. But Paul reminds us also that we should not wait. In other words, don't wait because we have no excuse. Let me change that. Don't wait because you have no legitimate excuse not to accept Jesus into your life right now. We read that Felix was getting uncomfortable. In fact, in verse 25, it said that Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now, and when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Church, how many of us try to find or say, well, when it's more convenient, I will learn about Jesus. When it's more convenient, I will start going to church. When it's more convenient, I will read my Bible or pray. When it's more convenient, I will accept my life and give it to Jesus. But church, as we see in Felix, there is no excuse to ignore God when he is speaking to you. Luke tells us that we could tell that, that Felix was shaken and moved by what Paul had said, but still would not move. He hears. He knows what Paul is saying is true. But he doesn't take action and he doesn't make a decision. And I find it so odd that Felix wanted to keep hearing more, but everything he heard just scared him more and more. You know, it's kind of like people that they, they love going to horror movies, and the whole horror movie, they just sit with their eyes closed, and they're screaming, and they're crying, but, but they keep going back for more horror movies. For us at church, I'll give you a better example. It's like when Matt Graham brings in his salsa and it is so hot that people take a bite and immediately they start crying and they, their nose starts running and they, they can't breathe. But those same people that are having this reaction from Matt Graham's salsa keep coming back for more of Matt Graham's salsa. 
That's kind of like Felix. He was affected by what Paul was saying about Jesus. He kept coming back for more, but he refused to make a decision. Church, maybe right now you have had one of those near-death experiences. Maybe, maybe right now you have seen someone close to you die, and it has scared you, but yet you still refuse to make a decision or take action towards Jesus Christ. Church, what we see in Felix is this. Remember, procrastination does not save you. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now, 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 today, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Church, today can be your day of salvation if you make it a day of decision and action toward Jesus Christ. But too many of us say, I will do it later. And I have to tell you, that phrase is one of the enemy's greatest tools. It allows, off to, allows us to put things off. It allows us to sleep on things. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, verse 45, when Jesus had asked his, his, his main three to stay with him and pray while he went away and prayed for a little bit. It says when he came, he, he came to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Procrastination, church, doesn't just hurt the lost, but it can hurt the saved. Procrastination doesn't just hurt the broken, but it can also affect the healed. Felix would listen to Paul for two years, but he never made a decision or took action. Church, when God acts, you act. When God speaks, you listen. Because you never know if you will ever get another opportunity. I know I've said this before, but when I worked in a trauma center, we would see trauma cases coming in, church. I promise you this. Those people that we saw in the trauma center and those people I saw pass away all had plans later for the day, but got interrupted by something else. Church, don't wait, because the longer you wait, you'll become distracted with less important issues. We read already in verse 26 that Felix had hoped and probably prayed that, that Paul would give him money so he could release him. And then it said, therefore he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius Fetus, Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to the Jew, do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. For two years, Felix didn't want Jesus. He just wanted cash. But church, hear my heart. Cash will never get you into heaven. Only Jesus will. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, no one comes to the Father. In other words, no one gets to heaven except through me. Your cash won't do it. Your, your job won't do it. Your material things won't do it. And church, I know this might upset you. Even all the nice things you do for people won't do it. It is only Jesus Christ. And maybe right now you are delaying and procrastinating and waiting for another time in your life where, where you will make that decision. But church, if 2020 has taught you anything, it has taught you this, that nothing is guaranteed, nothing is predictable, and you never should wait because you might not get another opportunity. Church, I think the greatest lesson we get out of chapter 24 is this. Don't wait because you may never get another opportunity again. And the more we lay, wait, the less important that decision becomes. And the less important that decision becomes, the more our heart gets hardened by sin. And when our heart gets hardened by sin, we can no longer receive Jesus. That's why Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But church, when we are so filled with sin in our lives, when our heart is so hardened by that sin, that sin makes Jesus no longer welcome in our lives. 
Felix was confronted with his sin and the need for repentance. But the longer he waited, the less important that decision became. Church, just so we're clear, there is a heaven. The Bible tells us there is a hell. And because of that, in your life, there is a hurry. One day will be your last day. And when that day comes, it will be too late to make any changes. And that's why I believe in Matthew 6, 34, it said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of its own things. Church, the only way we cannot worry about tomorrow if we've, is if we've made the right decisions and taken the right actions today. Let me leave you with this. Since, since none of us know when, it's, when our last day is going to be, why would you take a chance and wait till tomorrow? If I were to tell you, if you were going on an airplane ride today, and if I were to tell you there was a 25% chance that the plane would crash, would you get on that plane? The answer is probably not. Church, there's probably a 25% chance or so that something could happen to you tomorrow that will change your destiny forever. Knowing there's a 25% chance, are you willing to wait till tomorrow knowing of the actions and decisions you must take today? Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you, 
He is for you. 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 Thank you that you are for us. Father, I just pray that you'd remove the, the blocks and the boundaries that keep people from coming to you, Lord. Lord, let us come today. And so if that's you listening today, I just ask you to, to pray with me right now. You can just follow along. Lord, today I want to come to you. Lord, today I, I don't want to delay anymore. I don't want to put off, Lord, what needs to be done. I've come to the end of my strength. I've come to the end of my hope and I need you. So Lord, I ask you to reveal yourself to me. I want to give my life to you, Jesus. I want to follow you. Lord, I do accept you into my heart. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If that was you, please reach out. You can email Pastor Kevin at jofaith.com. Or if there is a Christian near, near you in your community, wherever you are, reach out to them. Say, I, I prayed this prayer today don't understand everything, but I know I need Jesus. And may the blessing of the Lord be with you all as we've prayed today, as we've heard God's word. May the peace of the Lord be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.